Welcome, bienvenue, Tonse. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, we're starting right at the uh, the hour, but we will give up maybe one or two minutes for more folks to log in. But we don't want to waste a moment of the precious time we have together today. Um, so just as you're arriving, we would love to um, hear from you in the chat how you're feeling as you come into this um, special panel discussion and um, community space, how you're feeling on arrival, you can use the chat. Um, there's an emoji option in the top right of the chat. So we'd love to know how you're feeling um, right now in an emoji, if you'd like to share. Um, we'd also encourage you, those folks that are on time, um, to maybe look for an object nearby you um, that you can hold. Um, or find an area or an object in the room that you're in or outside the window, something that calms and comforts you. And during um, the next hour and a half together, if you need to ground yourself, remember to breathe, connect to the ground beneath you, um, we encourage you to hold that object or find that place of focus. Um, this practice can remind us that we're human with nervous systems and we need to integrate what we hear and learn with how we feel. So my object today is a rock um, that I love, that I found with my seven-year-old on a beach in Greece um, when we were exploring the lands that his father comes from. So we have a big rock collection. Maybe other parents of young children can relate. Um, so yeah, I would just encourage you as you come through today to look for that place of focus or an object that you could hold to help ground yourself when and if you need to. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll launch in because we don't want to waste any time. Um, it's great seeing your emojis in the chat. Keep them coming um, throughout um, the session. Um, I want to give a big welcome to uh, everyone. Tonse bienvenue. I'm Natalie. I'm a national organizer with the Four Kids Network. We're a network of parents and grandparent-led teams from across the country, uh, and also a network of individual parents guardians, grandparents, relations, and allies taking climate action for our kids. So thank you for coming. Um, we hope that you can arrive today with all of yourself, your emotions, your identities, your questions, your curiosities, concerns, sadness, grief, joy, hope, resilience, love for our kids, for future generations, and life on planet Earth. Um, and if you didn't already, please do use the chat and share an emoji. Let us know how you're arriving today and how you feel. A huge thank you in advance to our moderator and panelists today for sharing their time and wisdom and knowledge with all of us. A warm welcome to Michelle Seesaw and our panelists, Chelsea Vowell and Clayton Thomas Mula. Also a thank you to the Four Kids National Support Team for hosting this space and all of you for taking time out of your busy lives to be here now or for those of you in the future who are watching the recording. And then FYI, we are recording this event for uh, sharing with our network members who couldn't be here and those who registered for the event. Our agenda today will be, um, first we'll start with a land acknowledgement and then we'll have about an hour of a moderated panel discussion. And the last, last half hour will be um, a live Q and A with our panelists. Um, so a couple of housekeeping uh, issues before I move on, just so you know how to participate in those things. The chat is enabled right now for all of you logging in to share an emoji of how you're feeling upon arrival. We'd love to see that. Um, and you're also encouraged throughout the session to submit um, questions to our panelists as they spark for you. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button and you can submit a question that we will, our um, four kids team will um, gather and share with Michelle, our moderator. Um, if you do feel comfortable, we'd love to know your name and where you are in the world uh, to include with your question. If you do need tech support, please use the raise hand function and someone from the four kids team will send you a direct message in the chat. Uh, a reminder that this is a free event, but if you are able, we are encouraging participants to make a pay what you can donation to an indigenous led campaign organization or community near you. And we will share right now some suggestions of some organizations in the chat. Um, a big shout out to the crucial work of Indigenous Climate Action, Raven, Raven Trust, and Wet'suwet'en Land Defenders. 
Uh, and to begin our event today, I'd like to hand the mic over to Sarah Yems from the 4 Kids Montreal team to first ground us with a land acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to do this today, Natalie. Um, as we said, we, uh, for our kids like to begin our meetings uh, always with a land acknowledgement. So with that in mind, um, across Turtle Island, these lands known as Canada, we are living on unceded indigenous territories. Our work for climate justice begins with recognizing and respecting indigenous rights. Parents and families in the For Our Kids Network live and act in communities that exist on land that has been taken from many indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, whether through unfulfilled treaties or outright occupation of unceded territory. We acknowledge the pain and trauma suffered by indigenous parents, kids and families at the hands of white supremacy, colonialization and residential schools, which have severed cultures, languages and relationships. We acknowledge that First Nations, Metis and Inuit people are the original stewards of the lands and waters. As a network, we know we have much to learn from indigenous resilience and stewardship as we strive to protect life on this planet. Myself, I'm a recent settler and guest in Chukchoge, the unceded territories known as Montreal, which is known as a gathering place for many First Nations. I want to acknowledge that the Kinokinyaga Nation are the original custodians of the lands and waters here. If you're interested to find out more about which territories you reside on, you can visit native-land.ca to find out more information about that. As someone who's only recently arrived on Turtle Island, I'm humbled by the process of learning about these lands, their history, and my place within that history. I give thanks for the lessons in resilience, caretaking, and reciprocity that have deeply instructed my own life. And today, these are things I think about, especially as a parent. I look forward to learning more in community with everyone here today. I would now like to introduce Michelle Cesar, our panel moderator. Michelle is a freelance journalist and contributing editor to McLean's. Her work can be found in The Walrus, Chatelaine, The Globe and Mail, Indigenews, and The Tai, and her essays on parenthood have been published in Romper. Michelle is a member of the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Treaty 6 territory, and she lives in Vancouver with her family. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Really nice to be here with you today, Tom Fay. Uh, I'm joining today from the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people, which is also known as Vancouver. Um, and we're really excited to hear from Chelsea and Clayton today, so I won't talk very long. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers and give them a chance to introduce themselves, but just a reminder that you can add questions directly in the chat that we'll be addressing at the end of the session. Uh, and also a reminder for everyone joining that the session will be recorded. So if you miss anything, you have to get up and get a coffee or attend to your kids. It's all going to be recorded for you later. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce these two brilliant speakers. I've been really moved by their work and their writing for so long. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing Chelsea Vowell, who's Métis from Mantu Sakahigan. My career is not as good as Chelsea, so I'm going to do my best here. Uh, and she's a resident of Amiskwasiwaskahigan in Edmonton. Creed's very phonetic, and yet I still struggle. Chelsea's a parent of six children. Uh, she's a Cree language instructor instructor and lecturer at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. She has studied law. She has a graduate degree. She's an incredible author. She's the author of Indigenous Rights, a guide to First Nations, Métis and Inuit issues in Canada, which is an incredible resource. She's also the author of an amazing collection of speculative short fiction called Buffalo is the New Buffalo, one of my favorite books the last year. Um, her work intersects language, gender, self-determination, futurisms, uh, resurgence. It's an incredible body of work. She's also the host of Métis in Space, a very fun podcast about science fiction and indigeneity. Uh, and she's the co-founder of the Métis in Space Land Trust. So she has an incredibly diverse and exciting body of work that I encourage everybody to check out. Welcome, Chelsea. And our other incredible speaker today is Clayton Thomas Mueller. Clayton is a dad. He is such a dad that he's joining us from his kid's bedroom today. Uh, joining us from Treaty 6, also the homeland of my people um, on the 
the Gatawagon Nation in Northern Manitoba from the, the nation in Northern Manitoba, but joining us from Winnipeg. Clayton is an author and an organizer. He has mobilized indigenous communities across North America to advocate for their land rights and for the climate. He is the author of an incredible memoir, Life in the City of Dirty Water, that I encourage everybody to read. Uh, he's also an award-winning director, a media producer, an organizer, a facilitator, uh, and just a real multi-talent. So we're really fortunate to have Chelsea and Clay with us here today. Thank you for joining us. How's everybody doing? Uh, yeah, I guess we, I was going to introduce, but that was, that was the fulsome introduction. I was just going to do it in Cree, so. <laughs> do Please do it in Cree. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, one of the things I do always say, though, is when I when I introduce myself as a parent of six children, is that uh, you know, and I'm always tired. So if I just start like blathering incomprehensibly, like that's it. That's that's what's going on. Um, yeah, having having that many kids and worrying about them all the time does make me a little like frazzled in the brain sometimes. But it's also really really great. I think that this hey, is a group. That Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think if there's any group that would relate to that, it's probably the people on this call. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Bonjour, thanks. Zongi Benisi and Nene Tishnikas, can you talk them? As mentioned, uh, I'm Cree from uh, Pagadawagan Cree Nation. Uh, it's the furthest easternmost Treaty 6 First Nation. <clears throat> um, but I live here in Treaty 1 uh, in our beautiful city of Winnipeg. And so just acknowledge, you know, all those Treaty One nations and of course the Métis Nation, this is their homeland as well. It's the Red River Valley, a lot of history here. Um, and I'm really, really uh, humbled to be on this panel. I'm, I'm kind of fanboying a little bit if I'm being honest. And, and you know, uh, it, it's really funny. I'm on my, my 16 year old's PC in his bedroom. Um, my, my other son lost the cord to my laptop. So yeah. Um, I had to, I had to kind of freeform it, and luckily, uh, I could come over here and use my kids' PC for our, our time together today. So yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I'm grateful to you both for being here today. <clears throat> uh, I, I was hoping we could start off the conversation just by thinking a little bit about how parenting for you has shaped your your thoughts around climate justice and climate work. It's obviously something that drives both of you in everything that you do. And I'd love to hear your relationships too, or your thoughts on the relationship between parenting and climate justice. Um, I think it, it makes everything more immediate. It makes everything more real. Like there's a goal now, you know, you've, you've got you've, you've got a stake in it. Like, I, I think a lot of people sometimes um, be just because of the enormity of, of, you know, sort of the the obstacles that are facing us and, and some of the, you know, just beyond the climate, just the world in general, it can be really easy to just, you know, shut down and say, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna focus on this one thing, but kids don't let you do that. I mean, they don't let you focus at all. <laughs> But, but also, you know, they give you, they give you a reason, you know, to, to, to care about things deeply um, because they're constantly questioning you about why, why are things like this, you know, and, and when it comes to like, why are things bad, you as the parent are the first person to, to try to explain to them, you know, what, what's going on. And, you know, I feel like um, children in this society are sort of socialized to, ignore their instincts about things and recognizing injustice because children you, you'll never meet a, a bigger sense of justice than a child's sense of justice and they know when things are not right um not just you know when it comes to them but just in general when they see things and so when they ask you those questions you have to like revisit those systems and say what have I become okay with what have I justified for myself um, and am I going to do that for my kid? Am I going to tell my kid, oh, you need to learn how to justify that people are houseless or justify that, you know, we're, we're, um, we're poisoning, you know, the earth. Like you, you, you just have to find a way to be okay with that. But I, I think as parents, you realize even if I've gotten to a point where I'm a little bit more comfortable with that, or I, or I don't think about it as much, once you have kids asking you those questions, puts you on the spot. All of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't be okay with that. And I don't want my kid to be okay with that. Yeah, um, you know, I, I agree with with everything Chelsea's describing and, you know, the context that kids provide as far as like, you know, just just being mindful about being in the moment and, you know, 
taking very seriously, you know, these existential threats that we're all collectively facing. But also, um, I think the thing that I, you know, I get a lot of like, it's both equally a source of like stress, but also empowerment um, is, you know, being the son of residential school survivors, my parents had zero filters growing up. And the way that they curated, um, you know, their experience surviving residential school to me as a child, like even as a little guy, just like five, six, seven, like and beyond was not filtered. And it was like, you know, ultra, ultra violent. Um, you know, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s and things were very different back then, you know. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I think for myself, I've been really hyper vigilant about curating complex multi-layered issues like colonization, like healing, um, you know, like calling out systems of oppression. And, and of course, the existential threat of climate change and trying to curate those issues in a way that does not make them feel powerless and that, you know, does not put pressure on them as a parent to their child, that they got to be these hyper political activists or that they got to like be like, you know, like warriors and, you know, do all of that. I try to do the same thing in the vein of spirituality as well. Um, I don't try to impose the red road on my kids, nor am I like a super red Jesus or anything, you know, I, I try to be very honest with my sons about my own healing journey when it comes to a belief in a higher power. So now that my sons are teenagers, you know, they're mixed race, um, their mother, um, you know, is Mennonite, and, um, but they very strongly identify as Cree you know, and, and, you know, and, and, and they go to ceremonies and, you know, my, my sons are skipping school tomorrow and we're, we're going to go to the, the Fridays for Future climate strike at the Manitoba legislature. Um, um, they asked me to come and help uh, MC. So my boys are going to come with me and we're going to bring our hand drums and, you know, and my, my son Felix was actually part of the first climate strike here in Manitoba. Um, when this process started uh, a few years back and, uh, you know, they went and protested a group of those youngsters from his school, um, the late Jim Carr's, you know, office. And um, yeah, you know, so I, I think things are going okay, but it's a, it's a daunting task, you know, to try and not <clears throat> get overwhelmed by the complexity and the magnitude of this present moment that we're in. And so, yeah, uh, I think that right off the bat, I just wanted to describe that that process of I feel really empowered that I have the opportunity to curate and, and be intentional about how my kids are introduced to things. And, 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 and I try to be very on. Well, I am very honest with them, um, you know, when they have questions for me uh, about the intersectionality, especially um, between, you know, things like truth and reconciliation and climate change. I love how you said that because, oh. Sorry, I was okay, just wanna say that's such a good point about the pressure. Like I remember growing up, um, the big thing in school was like the 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 rainforest was, you know, they were like the rainforest is gonna be gone in your generation, all these things, all these things, right? And as a kid, you just feel so like terrible and, and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do? The world's dying. Um, but also then I, I found indigenous kids had this extra pressure because like we hear a lot about, you know, you're the seventh generation, you're the one who have to, you have to bring back the language, you have to bring back the, the culture, you have to bring it all back and you got to save the planet and you're like a little kid and you're going, oh, that's a lot, that's a lot and I, and just I remember that like feeling all the time and, and definitely I've been, I've been careful not to put that on my kids, that like just understanding that it's, it's something that um, you know, it, it takes collective and intergenerational action and yet being being like really intentional about how you address the things because there's nothing worse than just feeling hopeless or, yeah. or feeling overburdened or having having it, you know, like you have this sacred duty, you know, we don't want to do that to our kids because in, in all of this, I think 
regardless of how difficult, whatever issue is we're facing, the only thing that gets us through is joy. You know, it doesn't mean we're laughing our heads off all the time, but just like the ability to like love one another and experience moments of joy is what sort of gets us through. And so, yeah, being really mindful not to, to sort of crush that in, in kids, but also in ourselves as adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. I think there is that that challenging balance when you have young children of not wanting to, you know, to shield them too much from from the reality of the world they live in, but at the same time not imbuing them with despair. Or, you know, often I hear about how kids are going to save save us from climate change, like the next generation, as if they have some magical ability that we as adults have ceded, <laughs> even though, you know, it's a movement that we should be leading with them and supporting them in their future. Um, and yeah, Chelsea, I love their focus on joy. Cause I feel like that's what I find inspiring with my daughter is, you know, she's still young enough that she just finds real pleasure in being in nature. And that reminds me of that sort of inherent connection that kids have to the world and how pure that is. And that's sort of what, you know, what we're fighting for and what we'd like to preserve. So I'd love to know more, Clayton, about how you also find, you know, joy in this work with your kids and, and where you find opportunities to celebrate that. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's a double edged blade, right? Like, 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 I, you know, I've been a, a, an elite global campaigner for my entire adult life fighting against, you know, extractive companies and support of, you know, indigenous communities all across mother earth and you know if i'm being honest um there's a reason why my partner and i aren't together anymore their mother you know we're still best friends you know I'm over at their house right now but um you know the work choices that i made um my family paid a high price and i was gone a lot of the time but um you know one thing that i felt really thankful for is that I've had a lot of opportunities to bring my sons with me on the road to like really isolated places, um, you know, indigenous places, you know, places where you can still drink from the river and places where you can still pick medicines and harvest food and, you know, and, and, you know, and even, even some really intense places, you know, I've brought my sons to the Alberta tar sands, you know, to Fort McMurray and toured them around the mines and showed them what was happening. Um, and it was really intense because their, their grandfather, their, their Opa, you know, my dad is like, well, he, he's a big boss guy up there. He works there, you know? And so we went and had dinner with Opa and Fort Mac and, you know, it's, it's always a funny conversation at the Christmas table with Opa and my kids and me, um, you know, because of the, the, just the complete polarization of, uh, you know, my life has been dedicated to decarbonizing our economy and, you know, lifting up. Um, this idea of, of, of climate reparations, you know, because at the end of the day, colonization caused climate change, you know, it's only been 200 years of industrialization. And we've literally changed the planet's chemistry to a degree where we have to start questioning our ability to survive on Mother Earth um, in the foreseeable future. And this is backed by, you know, the IPCC, the main global scientific body, they told us five years ago, we had 10 years um, to transition away from fossil fuel. And so, you know, I think throughout all of that, you know, the, the big thing for me is food. Um, I'm a hunter, you know, I fish, um, you know, I'm a fisher, for, a fisher person and I, you know, I, I hunt moose and, and, and all of that stuff. And um, I've really, really appreciated those moments where my sons have traveled with me to indigenous territories and where we've gotten to eat like country foods and like participate in, you know, other other nations ceremonies and celebrations and, you know, and, and eat freaky things, you know, they, get, they, they, they still get off on that like, whoa, what are we eating links or oh, porcupine? What the hell? What's next squirrel? You know, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, squirrels delicious. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just kind of a funny thing, eh? Where where those moments you really got to, well, at least for me, I've had to really, you know, use those moments to bring my sons. And, and, and sometimes that's not just to the bush. Sometimes it's to huge dynamic conferences like the Bioneers in San Francisco and, um, you know, other places as well. You know, they've come with me to New York City and 
uh, you know, for, for, for work at the UN or, or whatever, you know, and they're always listening and they're always watching. Um, and so, you know, I think now that they're teenagers, um, we just acquired a big drum. We're starting our own powwow drum group. And I'm really, really excited about that because as I'm, you know, I, I recently stepped down as an organizer um, to kind of focus more on writing and, and just being creative. And I think most importantly, um, taking this time to spend time with my sons as they, you know, as they experience adolescence here in the city of Winnipeg, you know, when you're young and Cree and you're growing up in Winnipeg, it's it's a good thing that your your dad's close by. So um, I've had to shift up a lot of things, and, and you know, and I'm, I did that to open up even more opportunities for my boys and I to go out there and you know and learn some things with each other and really celebrate this life and maybe figure out some stuff along the way too in terms of how we can contribute. Yeah, it's interesting too because that 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 concept of uh, you know like the the toll that it can take, regardless of what kind of activism you have, quite often your family can pay the price for if you have to be away. So for me, it's been a little bit different because um, because I you know so I've I've got six kids and uh, four of them are adults now. And we're a blended family, and I've got a seven and a five year old, so I've got like the little ones too. So I've, I've sort of like done it a few times. But um, but I was a single mom with with very young kids going through law school and stuff. And so um, I, I think like that fact of like I, I, I remember sitting down, like making the decision that whatever I was going to do, I, I needed to include my kids. Because one of the things that you've talked about, too, Clayton, is like is sort of you're trying to undo intergenerational trauma. Right. Like that's another thing that like we're supposed to fix. Um, but. But one of those things that that was so important to me is I wanted to make sure that I raised my kids in a healthier environment than than I was raised in. And so, you know, and that that means I'm learning a lot of the things that you've you've learned and dealing with anger and stuff like that. But I, I also I decided that, you know, work was work, whatever it is, whether it's like school or actual like I'm getting paid or I'm doing activist stuff work is work and I don't, I don't bring it home. And as much as I can, I would take those kids with me. And when they were younger, it was easier, you know, when they were babies. And, uh, and it's interesting too, because like, you know, some organizations are really cool with that. They're like, yeah, bring your baby. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm like changing diapers on the table while I'm doing a presentation or I'm out, you know, um, and others are like, no, absolutely not. And this also, I think is important because like, you know, for indigenous peoples and, and we all have different nations, we all have different, you know, backgrounds and stuff like that. But for indigenous peoples, I think, you know, including kids in everything is normal. Like the way that we learn is intergenerationally, like we want those kids present, they're always around. And it's so strange to be in spaces that are really hostile to children. And, and I don't want to be in those spaces. So I, I, I always made a point of like bringing my kids in and saying, you know, we're talking about our kids' futures. We're talking about the children. Won't somebody think of the children? But the kids need to be in the room. You know, they need to be running around. They need to be listening to whatever they're listening to. And eventually they also be, need to be the ones that we're, we're hearing, right? And the only way we're going to do that is if we don't create these separate spaces for kids and adults. They need to be in those spaces um, in a safe way. And so I think it's, it's, it's interesting because you do see you know, sometimes it's just not possible. And then, you know, what are, what are you giving? And then what are your, what is your family not giving? It's always that tension, right? It's really, it can be very, very difficult. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a really important point. You know, um, I, I know in our, like in our Indian community, um, kids are everywhere, you know, that's how they learn. That's how oral history is, is trans, you know, muted through to the next generation is through observation and, and, and listening and participating, you know, and, and, and also, you know, and having conversation um, with, with, a, with a multi-generational community surrounding you, you know, that's how, like in every word in our Cree language, you know, it can connect you from a stream that you're standing beside all the way to the stars in just one word. And, 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 and so, you know, you know, um, for us, a lot of a lot of the way, a lot of the traditional ecological knowledge, a lot of the things that the world is is pressuring indigenous peoples to share to survive climate change, um, you know, comes it lives inside of our language, and so the, that kind of community educational system is so critical for its success, right? And um, 
you know, and I, and I think that that's, that's been a really cool thing, you know, is, is just watching my, my sons when, when they're with me at Indian gatherings and, you know, and they're like doing their thing, but they're listening, you know, and they can get on a microphone and they, you know, they've gotten onto television cameras and man, and they lay out all the different things, indigenous rights, climate justice, all the things, even just as youngsters, because they, they spent that time just listening, you know, not just to me, but their aunties and uncles in the movement. And, um, you know, and I think that, I think that that's a really good thing. And, you know, and, and I gotta raise my hands to their mother too, you know, because the great thing about, you know, it's both challenging and good, but being in a mixed relationship, raising co-parenting children, you know, she brings in this other element of, of how to not go too far one way, you know, and or the other, and, and, and to try and have balance as far as the moccasin on the right foot and the adidas on the left foot, right? Kind of reality that Native people, you know, who live in a settler colonial state have to grow up with. And so I find that, um, you know, I, I celebrate the balance that my kids are able to, to just demonstrate naturally, where I struggle even as a man, you know, to, to maintain that work life spirit and play balance. And I, I think that it's, it's really, it's really intense. You know, a lot of the people that I know that work in the movement, you know, we all have devastating autoimmune diseases, you know, from trauma and stress, you know, because on top of growing up in Canada and, you know, dealing with all of the things like residential school and that, you know, when you do this work organizing in our communities, you know, you're, you're not just organizing protests or, or community dialogues, you know, you're doing crisis intervention with peers and, you know, you're, 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 um, you're, you know, it's, it's a peer to peer support counseling and, you know, really intense stuff, eh? crisis intervention. And um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons too, why I had to step back um, just because of my, my diabetes and my, my thyroid disorder, you know, psoriasis, I mean, heck, you name it. Um, and just about every allied campaigner I know um, that's my age is dealing with the same issues, you know, and, it, and it's tied to that the never ending fight or flight response being triggered by all of the things that we're dealing with. And yeah, you really have to be intentional, um, especially as a parent um to keep that in check because you know if, if we're not healthy as parents then our kids pay the price you know and mm -hmm. um and i've seen it you know time and time again just people burn out and and they suffer and um it takes a real long time to come back from a career burnout i've had about six of them so i know <laughs> that could be your next book <laughs> that's i mean i think oh Sorry again, I just, yeah, I just keep like, yeah, we, I, that's the other thing. And I, and I want to move on to more positive things in a second, but it can't, we, we can't underestimate like the disabling effects of, of doing this kind of work. And so, you know, I, I, that's exactly it. I'm, I'm hitting a wall too. I'm not, I'm just not able to do the kind of work that I was able to do before. And, and so like, you know, you have to every once in a while just kind of go back and be like, all right, well, it, you know, I feel guilty because I'm not doing all this work, but I, I can't do it anyway. So what can I do? I can like not stress out, not guilt trip myself so much and like go and be a good parent. Like if that's all I can do, that's still amazing work, right? But yeah, that's that's something too I, I worry about now with my adult kids is I don't want to see them on that trajectory to eventual burnout. So like how how can we build communities of care where that where it's not disabling to 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 engage in this work and i i don't have any answers for that but that is something i think that we really really need to keep like foregrounded in our minds when when we're going forward and, and just thinking about like and how do we support each other when we do because there's still expectations people still want you to do the thing because you did the thing right <laughs> and so it's yeah it's tough just recognizing that you know and I think that's why it's so important that it's intergenerational like you know whether it's burnout or just like you've done it enough and you have another role to play like we need to be making spaces for folks to to be in uh doing the thing in at all levels so and sorry Michelle <laughs> I don't want to keep cutting you off no I don't <laughs> I never want to pause this conversation I've just been thinking as you're both speaking you know I think there's 
there's a growing awareness among non-Indigenous parents of how much of this work is carried by Indigenous people and increasingly how how high the toll for a lot of that work is. I mean, you know, in BC where I live, you can really see that in Wet'suwet'en with the work that land defenders there are doing or in Fairy Creek to defend, you know, old growth forests. These, these movements have really high costs that are being borne by Indigenous people on the front lines. And it, coming out of a pandemic too, or hopefully coming out of a pandemic someday, <laughs> though it's still continuing. I think everybody is is quite isolated more than they have been in the past and also fatigued and, and really worn down. And so, you know, as, as non-Indigenous parents or people in the movement are looking for ways to support this work and build community, I often hear from them a lot of concern about wanting to do things the right way or being concerned that taking action could cause further harm. So there's, you know, there's a genuine desire to help, but also a genuine fear of like where to begin. And I wonder for both of you, having been on the front lines of this work for so long, what you think those kinds of meaningful first steps should look like from, from other people who would like to support indigenous land and water defenders. Well, I definitely wanted to to react to, to something uh, Chelsea had said, and you know, about, you know, the, the, the pressure that our children face when they're dealing with this existential threat you know like remember my kid Felix being like I'm literally growing up during the end of the world dad stop making such a big effing issue about it you know and <laughs> over something I was upset about right and it just I was like oh <laughs> just like hit me in my heart and uh um I think that I think that you know um one of my good friends Bill McKibben you know the author and uh, co-founder of 350, you know, he's always on grandparents. He's like, you're retired. Why are these kids going and met, getting criminal, de uh, de like uh, criminal records and going to jail? You know, when you're a retiree, you can have a tax paid holiday and it doesn't matter. It's not messing with your career. Like, all the old people need to be going out there on the front line, getting arrested. And by old people, I mean like non-native, <laughs> like people with money, you know, that can afford lawyers. Um, um, you know, so I just wanted to bring that up, you know, as a, as a number one thing to say that, you know, um, we have to significantly raise the bar collectively in community to this government, this Trudeau government needs to, get a backbone and stand up to big oil. These companies that are operating here in Canada and the tar sands and beyond, or they posted the biggest profits they've ever posted in the history of their operations during the biggest economic recession probably that the planet's going to face uh, in, in our history. And, 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 and the Trudeau government is not like passing a windfall profit tax on these guys. They need to be making these companies pay and that money can help with the transition, you know? Um, and, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, the, the, the opposite side of, 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 of uh, Trudeau spectrum, you know, you know, his enemies and in, in the political halls are organizing too. And they want to go the complete opposite direction of science and human rights. And um, so, you know, we've got a, it, it's a very urgent time. Um, and, you know, and I think that it's, that there's, there's tremendous opportunity though. Um, you know, when people talk about the transition off of oil, they, they just, they can't imagine it. But this transition is going to create millions and millions of wicked, cool, unionized, highly technical jobs that allow people to stay home and not have to fly to places like the tar sands, you know, because we need thousands and thousands of workers to decarbonize and transition all the infrastructure in Canada to become zero carbon. And we need to electrify the North and create food security in the North in a way that's not tied to these big centralized power grid systems, you know, use technology, cogeneration and battery storage. Um, so that our communities are sustainable, you know, and we're not building these little ghettos, you know, that we can spread houses apart again and let people have land to grow stuff on. And, um, you know, th 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 there's a lot of opportunities there, you know, and I think, I think here in Manitoba, where I live, you know, like 
I think about truth and reconciliation. I think about reparations. You know, there's been a lot of performative actions in Canada to apologize over the legacy of residential school genocide, but not a lot of like tangible actions. And we hear land back consistently, right, in the media, especially from young people. And a lot of people can't wrap their heads around what that means. They kind of freak out, you know, especially, you know, rich white landowners. And this perpetuating like 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 campaign to make Canadians believe that natives are somehow a, a, a drain on the taxpayer, you know, it's ass backwards when the truth of the matter is, is that native people were big brothers and sisters and we've been subsidizing the accumulation of wealth since the inception of this country, you know, because Canada holds all of our land in trust. And so when Canada needs to borrow a trillion dollars, they can because they've got all of our native land in trust, right? And people don't understand that, you know, and we, have, you know, one only has to look to the Squamish nation in Vancouver. Then the 99 year lease ran out on the North shore, the entire city flipped out. Oh my God, they're going to get the mall, all the condos. Oh, the natives are going to, they're going to send us back to Europe. Oh, it's just ridiculous. But now they've, you know, the Squamish nation has another 2000 units that they're bringing in housing with a big social housing component, unlike any other developer in the city, into the North Shore, some of the most valuable real estate by the Lionsgate Bridge in all of Canada, if not the planet, and they're thriving, you know, and the, and the white people who live there and all the other people who live there, they're thriving and, you know, it's not a bad thing, land back. But, you know, we need to take some tangible steps right now to level the economic playing field between Canada's most marginalized population and the rest of us, you know, the rest, the rest of Canadians. Um, and that's Indigenous peoples, you know, we need to, and there are things we can do right now. And here in Manitoba, you know, it's my dream, you know, that, that reparations and reconciliation are wrapped up into the return of our rivers back to the original form and the decommissioning of dams. The Manitoba Hydro, a crown corporation, wants to be the Exxon of the future. They want to be the gas stations, right? And so they want to control all the EV charging stations that they're building in the province. And they're setting a price tag on that, it's like $12.50 a charge. Why don't First Nations own those? You know, that's reconciliation money. That's forever money, as long as the sun's last money, you know, um, that'll help us, you know, in a good way to establish what we were originally always supposed to be. You know, sharing that river, two canoes, going down the river, not interrupting each other's paths. Um, and I believe that we can get there through approaching this issue of climate justice and, you know, acting on climate and making sure that we're, you know, taking those 94 recommendations of the truth and reconciliation as the foundational base of that work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it is it, that that sort of myth that Canada is subsidizing, you know, indigenous peoples, but Canada is a rich nation because of natural resources, you know, and now the biggest the, in, the biggest industry in this country is real estate, literally land, you know. So, yeah, it's wild to me. But yeah, when people are, are saying, like, I want to do things, but I don't want to mess up. So I would say the first thing is, is like, you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up. Be OK with it. Be OK with messing up. And learning from it like that shouldn't stop you um just like you know feelings of guilt or shame when you start learning about colonialism those things should not stop you those 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 are part of the process of 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 understanding systems and then you know education can only get us so far as well uh this is my big beef is like we have this sort of idea that if just everybody knew better then everything would be different but like if education was going to get us out of where we're at it would have done it already there's plenty of ed educated people out there so education isn't enough you, there has to be action so I, I i sort of have like three principles for action if you want to like be in solidarity with sort of any group at all that you're not a part of you just have to do three things and and they're they should be simple but they're not it's like listen to them listen to what they have to say about their own experiences and you know, and that's, that's not even where we're at in this country. We won't even do that. There's always an expert from outside the group who's like, actually, I know what the Indians need, you know, <laughs> like, could you just listen, just listen to what people are actually saying about their own experiences. The second thing is believe what they're saying, right? And that should be easy as well. But again, people just want to second guess and say, well, you don't really understand. Oh, you're houseless. 
you know, um, I'm listening to what you're saying about what that's like, but you don't really understand what's going on. I'm not sure you're, you, you have the whole story. Let me tell you what your experience is. And then, you know, and then believe that they have the solutions to, to, to the problems, right? Like believe communities when they say, Hey, we, we know what we need to do. And, and that seems to be the hardest thing of all is just like accepting that uh, particularly groups who are experiencing marginalization could have any idea of how to get out of there. Um, you know, and so believe us when we say that we have some solutions for, for what's going on with the, the climate, you know, indigenous peoples have been here for thousands of years, um, not roaming around free, never touching nature. Like let's, let's dispute this idea of nature as being untouched. Indigenous peoples have been directly in, you know, interacting with the land for thousands of years. We have controlled burns out on the prairies. Uh, you have treaty with beavers. So beavers, you know, you, you don't hunt them so that they make these watersheds that also create sort of systems that that uh, prevent large fires on the prairies, one of the scariest things ever from, from really spreading. Um, you know, you, you, you have people like planting uh you know, fruit trees in, in forests that still exist. Like we've been there doing the thing, but because it doesn't look like, you know, what Europeans see, they're like, oh, the natives are just roaming free. They're part of nature. And it's not just humans. Animals, animals change their environment too, right? There's no such thing as pristine, untouched nature. We can get in and get our hands dirty. We just got to do it in the right way. So believe, believe that there are solutions. And then the third thing is just to support, support what's, what's already there. Like, you know, I've talked about this a lot. Nobody has to reinvent the wheel. Nobody has to reinvent a movement. Whatever it is, whether it's the environment or, in, you know, something else that you're interested in, people are out there doing the thing and they've been doing the thing for a long time. So tap into what is already built. You know, don't burn yourself out trying to build the thing. Just tap into what's there, you know, listen, believe and support. And that can be maybe not glamorous. That's like, doing the dishes at the event, that's hauling firewood, that's, you know, getting food for the elders, that's, you know, making sure that you've set up childcare so people who normally can't attend events are, are showing up, you know, do those things. And that material support is going to make so much more difference than feeling like you have to be, you know, um, doing activism in a certain way. You don't have to be on the front lines all the time. You don't have to be, um, you know, doing things in the way that you see, maybe it's writing, you know, just like calling, call your MLA and your MP until they, they, they know your name. And they're like, oh God, okay, I'll do it. Cause I don't want to hear from this person again, be a thorn in somebody's side. Like there's so many ways, you know, according to your own abilities um, and your positionality that you could be participating, but it really needs to be based on that idea of listening and believing communities. When we say that this is what we, this is what we know, this is what we need um, and not second guessing it. Yeah. And then if somebody's like, hey, you did this thing and, it, and you were kind of a jerk about it, just just like be like, oh, okay, okay, how can I be better? And don't let that stop you, right? Yeah. I yeah. I love how you say that. It's because it's so true, right? It's it's not always glamorous work, this kind of work. And I think everybody imagines being on the front lines of a protest, but there's so much work happening in communities too. And and also, I, I think it is important to, to remind people of that idea of the way that, you know, the truth that Indigenous people stewarded their lands forever. And, and so what we think of as the natural environment was co-created with these Indigenous stewards of the land. And there's often, I think, this idea that there's like nature and then there's human civilization and you can parcel the two out, which is often what gets us into some of these disasters, right, where you could imagine that Canada cares about environmentalism while maintaining these tar sands as if you can separate those impacts, whereas everything is is connected. You can't kind of parcel out the environment. It's all it's all one thing. And so, you know, it's not necessarily about the biggest or most significant issues somewhere else. It's also about what's happening in your community has connections to what's happening everywhere. Um, I think as we're oh go ahead. No, I was going to say, we just have about 10 minutes left. So I was wondering your final thoughts. And Clayton, I think you were just going to take it from there. Yeah, no, I, I just I just really, really want to, you know, like like dazzle jazz hands and all of that for for, you know, not giving up. Um, you know, if, if you're agitating on solidarity, if you're agitating on how to be an ally, like you're not a native. Um, but you take these issues really serious, um, you know, we really need your help. 
you know, like if you look at the population demographics of Canada, 87% of the population is white presenting. And so a lot of the time, you know, brown, black folks and, and indigenous people's experiences are out of sight and out of mind. And that's why shit just keeps happening, you know. We don't, you know, we're not living in a post-colonial realm. Neo-colonization continues to pop up in our lives daily. And it's the same story, it's just different players. And until these issues become like a, a white person's problem, um, you know, that they will continue to persist. And 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 that is you know, it's most damaging impacts, of course, is on our children, you know, and their attitudes about themselves and about each other and about society in general. And so, you know, I think that Native people have a lot to offer um, when it comes to how this country is going to adapt and, and mitigate climate change, um, because we're experts at rapid adaptation. We're experts at migration. Um, most native people who live in cities, even though you don't think about it, we're environmental refugees. We had to move to the city because the austerity agenda of the federal government, they made it so freaking bad on the res that you got to leave the res just to have a better quality of life. And, you know, and, and unlike the rest of Canada who have the mobility of rights, it's right there in the charter of human rights, indigenous people still live under apartheid. And we don't have mobility of our of our right to harvest, to hunt, fish, and trap, to um, you know not pay taxes. Um, you know all of these things that 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 are, are are enshrined in Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, in the Number of Treaties, in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. You know we have the right to sovereignty and self determination, and that's just the way it is. You know, um, and whether this generation gets that or the next. Well, that's entirely up to us right now, you know, and, and we don't have to keep, you know, making the same mistakes over and over again. We can do tangible things right now to level the playing field, um, you know, and, and, and that'll make everybody feel really positive. You know, if the native stops suffering so much in their homeland, that's going to be a really powerful thing and make everybody feel really positive about the future and moving forward. And, um, you know, and we're not going to be able to do it all, you know, Chelsea mentioned the seventh generation, you know, and she's right, it was real stressful growing up as a seventh generation person, because it was on our shoulders to change the world. And then when, I don't know about you, Chelsea, but when I hit my mid 30s, and I realized that I wasn't going to be part of that generation that was going to change the world completely. And we did a lot. But, you know, that a lot of this stuff's passing down to my kids now. That was, I got really blue, you know? And so, you know, we, we have an opportunity right now in a multi-generational truth and reconciliation healing journey that Canada is on, um, you know, as a settler colonial state with its original people, with the original people whose land it's, it's, it's you know, occupying. Um, and it's important we use these terms, um, you know, um, because it's the truth. And, um, We've got tremendous opportunities right now to do incredibly powerful things um, as we go through a processes of trial and error, convenings, and you know, um, making mistakes, maybe stepping on each other's toes, but we'll get it right. We just have to keep at it. And white folks, you got to understand, man, we get people coming all the time trying to extract our bodies, our land, our resources. So if some gookus are a little bit harsh to you and, and, and tell you to F off or tell you very specifically what they want you to do, and it might not be what you like, well, we might just have to deal with that, okay? Because we're very protective now because we've just been extracted from so much and we're sick of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing I like to, to say is, you know, uh, sometimes folks have this idea that uh, we're going to get it together. The world's going to get it together uh, once things get bad enough. You know, that's why post-apocalyptic fiction, you know, The Last of Us, all this stuff is like so, it's so powerful. People are like, yeah, yeah. You know, like as soon as it gets bad enough, I'll, 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 I won't worry about capitalism and I won't worry about like the mundane. I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to focus on saving the world. Right. And, I'm, and, and that's when I'll do it. Just like, let me know, let me know when it happens. I'll, I'll be there. Right. But indigenous peoples are already post-apocalyptic. Like we've literally been through it all. We've been through world ending events. You know, like we're talking about 
you know, uh, pandemics already, uh, mass migration, you know, climate change, the genocide of the buffalo, the destruction of entire societies, all of it, we've, we've, we've been through it, you know, you, you think up uh, an apocalyptic scenario and, and Indigenous peoples were there, but we're still here, you know, we're still here and we made it through, um, not, not because we became uh, more insular or more scared of the other or more, you know, holding on like we we need to make sure nobody gets in and takes our resources, but because we shared and we expanded our kinship and we cared more and we took care of each other and we took people in. And so I think like what we have to look at as a society is, you know, the fact that the fact of climate change is, is really scary. You know, we're looking at mass migration at a rate that's never been seen in human history. And that's that's a fact, that's, that's, that's happening and it's coming. We're looking at millions of people around the globe being displaced because of climate change. And so we need to think right now, how are we gonna build a society that takes that in, that takes people in and, and builds around displacement instead of what we're seeing right now, which is like sort of a hardening of the borders and and the justification and the dehumanization of the other because we want to feel safe and so if we don't let other people in and we don't treat them as humans we're safe right and that's what we're going to do in crisis if we don't already have something else built in and that's to me is the most important thing that we can be focusing on is is how do we build a society where all of us have enough and all of us have have those systems of support because if you think about like in your lifetime the, the certainty that things are not going to go well, that, you know, you're, it's, it's part of human life. You're going to experience loss. You're going to lose people that are close to you. You're going to go through things that feel like it's the end of your, of your world. And that's just what we all experience. And what gets us through is other people, right? It's, it's other people in the support of our, our loved ones and our communities that get us through. So how do we expand that circle of care to make sure that it's there for all of our kin, all of our human kin and our non-human kin? And it's those big ideas that I think, you know, bringing it back to young people is, it's those ideas that I think we need to be guided by what young folk are asking for, the support that they need and the love that they need and the support has to be there for all of our young people across the globe, regardless of, of, of who we are. And uh, if we can just start thinking that way and start building that better future now, instead of waiting for things to get better, then I think we're on a good track. So don't, don't wait for some magic call, you know, where, okay, guys, it's time now. No, it, the time is now. The time is now and every generation is going to have to fight for a better world. Like, it, you know, like we didn't do it. We didn't, we didn't save the world, Clayton, but we did something. And every single generation is going to have to fight for the gains that the last generation made. You know, it's going to get clawed back. But if we just come into it knowing that, that it's, you know, we make the world better. We, we you know, let's do it. Let's do it right now. Hi, hi. Thank you both for that. That's such a powerful note to end this part of the discussion on. And I mean... Chelsea, just because you mentioned The Last of Us, I think we should all take from that show a lesson, which is that the only thriving community after the apocalypse is the communist one. <laughs> we're there living wow, cooperatively. I thought you were going to bring up the, the scene with Graham Greene. Graham Greene is, oh, no, he's like, not, yeah. This is like it's, totally like. Just chilling it. in the apocalypse. <laughs> Natives and socialists. Yeah, is, they were hungry. In the post-apocalyptic future. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Giving them soup, oh, okay. <laughs> native hospitality in the apocalypse. I think that's the lesson of the show. Um, yeah. Well, we have some time for a Q and A, um, and I I feel like you two provided so much that I think answered some of the questions that came in uh, in advance of the chat. One from Megan Guelph was about direct actions that non-indigenous parents can take um, to help, and you both spoke to the the necessity of kind of getting involved in your communities and taking collective action of not waiting, but also of looking to see like how you can support work that's already happening. So I think it's hard to create maybe a blanket recommendation for like concrete steps people can take, you know, beyond looking around at how they can support the work that's taking place where they are. Um, but do you two have anything you would want to add to that for someone who's looking for maybe a direct action to start with? Besides buying your book, which I think I mean, is a great direct action. 
you know, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, you know, I, I used the word performative earlier to describe, you know, the way that a lot of non-native Canadians, appro you know, approach or don't approach, completely get frozen in apathy over about colonization. You know, we've got a couple special days in the calendar, uh, residential school day and indigenous people's day where, you know, people can talk about residential school in their workplace or their place of faith or wherever with their families. It's all over the TV. Um, but you can do those things every day. Um, you know, and I think a really important thing um, is, you know, as parents is, 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 is that, you know, whether it's at your place of work or on your school committee, um, you know, any institution of governance that exists in your community, we need to be pushing for, you know, um, the, the adoption and ratification of, the, of, of, of all of the elements of the baseline that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples provide us. And it's just a baseline. Like it's meant to be an aspirational document to build from, not like the bit, not like it, it's a bare minimum standards document to provide colonial settler colonial states with a foundation to build even stronger foundations um, in terms of relationship with original peoples. And I think that here in Canada, you know, very specific uh, political action document is the 94 um, recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You know, I very strongly believe and and everywhere I have an opportunity to talk about it now, you know, I'm fixated on this frame and it very much comes from indigenous climate action. But colonialism caused climate change. And so whatever Canada does uh, in terms of political, economic, social, reorganizing related to the existential threat of climate change, the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission need to be a part of that foundation, you know, as we build it and reorganize a new economic paradigm. Because if we don't deal with, 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 with this issue, um, you know, we're going to have the same land use uh, struggles, the same land back protests over mega wind farms. Um, you know, that are being built to power up diamond mines in the north, you know, um, we're going to be dealing with issues, uh, you know, like, I, I truly believe that all of these pipeline battles that we've been involved in in the last, you know, 20 years, that someday we'll be fighting over the same pipelines, but they'll have well, fresh water flowing through them that's been privatized and being sold to the biggest bidder on the international market, because Canada is home to the majority of available fresh water, you know, out of any economy on the planet. And that migration that Chelsea talked about related to climate change, you know, we're talking about a displacement of literally 3 billion people because of the majority of people who live on Mother Earth live on coastal, low-lying coastal areas. And, and, and Canada is gonna be a big destination for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, and we have the space, we have the resources, There's more than enough land, water and food on the planet to deal with, you know, population, overpopulation is just a white supremacist screwed up part of the manipulative narrative that Chelsea was describing in terms of militarization, hardening of borders to deal with the climate refugee crisis that has already begun. And, you know, so there's a lot to think about, you know, here, here in Canada. And, 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 and I think that, um, that uh, Indigenous peoples, you know, we've got, I don't think our traditional ecological knowledge is enough to solve the contemporary global issues that we're facing now. I think that there, it's a mix of, of Western science, which is very young and naive, and the very complex Indigenous science and traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and, 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 and quite frankly, uh, faith, you know, magic, hope, the unknown, a greater power, the universe. Um, I think those those things, if we can bring those things together, then you know, then I have great faith um, that we're going to be okay. As a matter of fact, that we're going to thrive, you know, and have true happiness. Um, but you know, I do believe that hyper individualized consumerism um, in, in the Cree way is is like the Witegu escaping into the world, the cannibal spirit. And we're all suffering from this big sickness, this emptiness in our core and 
and trying to fill it with consumerism and social media and whatever, when the only thing, and this, this is not just for native people, this is for every single human being on the planet, we need to be connected to nature. We have to be connected to the sacredness of place. And, you know, and so however we do that, you know, I encourage all of you, you know, uh, especially you parents of kids, you know, spend time out in the bush with your little ones, with your teenagers, go camping. It's cheesy, I know, but do it, you know? Um, yeah. There's a question in the chat that I love that I'd like to, to offer to both of you, which is from Pat. And they're asking how we can collaborate so that we can take time to heal, which I think is a really powerful concept in this work. I mean, we've heard a lot today about what a, you know, what a burden it can be to carry and, and the cost that it takes. So how do you both envision rest in your work or the, you know, the need to create opportunities for people to rest and heal? Oh, well, that's a like. tough one. Cause like, you know, in, in, in general too, we need that space to heal. Like the, like I saw, yeah, the planet needs to heal and, and human beings have to heal and, and indigenous people want to heal. We just like got to, people have to stop punching us in the face. You know, like the, this is what I feel about like truth and reconciliation, right? Everybody wants to run to the reconciliation. Um, but like, I, I need, I need people to stop hurting us first. Like we can't heal from harm if we're still experiencing harm. So like, I don't know what that space would look like for us, you know, cause it's, you know, you sit in there, you're just trying to live your life. You're trying to, you're trying to relax. And every day there's something new. There's something, there's, there's new uh, evidence of, you know, unmarked burials. There's, there's somebody else getting shot by the police. There's, you know, somebody else missing. It's just, there's, it's just constant, you know, you're doing all of those things and that trauma is just raining down on you all the time and you can't escape it and you can't just ignore it either. So, you know, I'm not sure about that idea of like having space to heal. I think we're, we're trying our best while we're still undergoing trauma because we haven't in this society, haven't prioritized stopping harm before we try to address it. And, and you know, if there's anything that I would like from, from this government or any government in the future is to act on what they already know. Like we, you know, so many times people are like, well, we don't know enough about this issue. There's not enough. Inf yes, there is like every, every issue out there has been researched to death and stop thinking of indigenous stuff as like separate. This is Canadian stuff. You know, when we talk about like indigenous history and culture and land and all that, we're talking about Canada. This is everybody's stuff that you got to learn about. And, uh, and we have the research and we have the recommendations. It's not just the TRC. You've got RCAP, you know, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples that came out after OCA set, set out like a 20 year uh, strategy for, for fixing the relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples, 444 recommendations and a handful have been implemented. We got the, you know, the Office of the Correctional Investigator telling us exactly what's wrong with our justice system and what needs to be changed. And even providing report cards year after year of how the government's proceeding. They're not doing it. You know, we had the murder and missing Indigenous uh, women's and, and girls in inquiry. We know what the issues are. We know what we should be doing. So there's no reason for us to be running around like chickens with our heads cut off going, what do we do? What do I do? We know. We just have to have the political will to do the things and to force those people who are in those positions of power, who have such a limited view of the future because of the election cycle. You know, they're campaigning, they get in, they understand their portfolio for a year, second, third year, they might start doing something and then they're campaigning again. Like we can't operate on the, on that schedule. We have to operate on the long schedule. You know, think about those generations, those seven generations, but not, not in the pressure way, but in the... We have to think about how our decisions are impacting our descendants that we'll never meet. You know, think think beyond our own personal needs and, and beyond even the needs of our own children, because of course we care about them and we prioritize them, but think beyond that. You know, what are we leaving for the next generations? And the fact is, is that we know what we have to do. We just have to like have enough space to do it. And, and this comes back to the healing, like under capitalism, capitalism is all about draining you of all of your excess, you know, energy. You, if you were not drained at the end of the day, then capitalism as, as a jealous lover has said, you haven't given me enough. Right. 
And, and so I think like we, we can start in so many ways. We have to like, we have to think about the ways that we work, um, where we live, all of it, and just do less that doesn't, doesn't help us. We're just doing it for, for somebody else to profit off of us. So where we get that space, God, I don't know, but I sure hope that, that folks are working on providing that space and community because we do need it. Just stop punching us in the face for a bit. That, that would help. Somebody's That's a very actionable that piece of That's like the quote that broke this whole panel. That was like, like capitalism yeah. is a jealous lover who's like, I want more. <laughs> but I think, I mean, it's so easy now, right, to be overwhelmed by just like the sheer volume of injustice, especially since we can all chug directly from the fire hose of social media and like the news cycle and just feel that overwhelming despair. So I think that is, you know, it's wise advice to consider like, also where you can conserve your energy and direct it as opposed to trying to just stay on top of everything terrible that's happening to indigenous people into the world. <laughs> you know, there's a need, I think, to, to try and think like, what can I do here? And if the answer is nothing, maybe you log off for a little while, take a break, look at the ceiling. Um, we yeah, have a few we more really, questions. Oh. oh, sorry, just one, one thing. Uh, we really, really need your help. Um, to blow this um, this controversy right out right out of the borders of Canada and into the international media, the erasure of the the unmarked graves that are being found um, by the death of the monarch um, of the death of Queen Elizabeth, it just completely knocked out everything um, out of the news cycle, and and we really really need all journalists on deck bloggers, podcasters, to be lifting up um, the voices of Indian residential school survivors, the people who survived and still raised families and went out and got degrees and are out there right now kicking ass, even amidst all of this. We need you to be lifting up their voices and, and calling out Canada on this issue because like murder to missing Indigenous women and girls, it's a very complex and nuanced issue, but it's tied to this, this, this economic system that is, is fundamentally based on the suppression of indigenous people's collective rights, the dispossession of indigenous peoples from our homelands to provide backdoor access to extractive corporations working with provincial or territorial governments to take our resources. And, 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 you know, and we really need your help to help make these complex and nuanced issues um, known to the world through storytelling and, and that means lifting up our experts on your platforms, you know, but this is a very important ask uh, right now that is a tangible thing that, you know, people can do. Um, and I think that, you know, when it comes to climate change, um, you know, uh, there's a couple political things traveling, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the uh, fossil fuel proliferation treaty work that's happening. Uh, super high level stuff, but you know that that stuff can be adopted by your union, by your church, uh, by your municipality, by your school division, um, to put pressure on the actual you know city or or province or territory, and eventually hopefully the federal government. And um, and you know as far as um, really really cool stuff aside from ICA, you know the the good people at the Yellowhead Institute. It's like an all indigenous, like, like kick ass. Well, not all indigenous, but just really kick ass researchers, um, you know, that are making some super amazing links. Um, you know, so I encourage you to check out the Yellowhead Institute as well um, in terms of, you know, inspiration of, of, of tangible things that you can do to move forward. Sorry, go ahead, uh, Michelle. No, I, I think that's such an important thing to remind people of. And I was thinking of earlier this week or on Friday, an article that was published by Indigenous, which is another great source for, um, for coverage of Indigenous issues in Canada, um, had a story about a judge in Kamloops who sentenced land offenders to prison time and while sentencing them also denied the existence of unmarked graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And to me, that just really captured how interconnected these issues are, right? To deny indigenous rights and indigenous history is also to deny the urgency of climate action and, and the role that you know indigenous sovereignty and land rights play in that. It is all really intimately connected. And 
there is no no climate justice without affirming and upholding those indigenous rights and recognizing you know what the truth of indigenous histories are so i think that is a really important issue to keep in mind and for for everyone who's an advocate in this work to elevate so i'm grateful to you for bringing that up um I think we we probably won't get to <clears throat> all the questions in the chat, but I, I do think that you've answered some of them just through what you've been saying in such thoughtful ways. Um, but one question I, I think I'll bring in from Samantha is, um, you know, a question about how to engage young people in climate activism. I mean, I think for both of you, you've talked about how you've involved your children in this work from such an early age, but for parents maybe who are thinking of how to begin bringing their children into these movements. Do you have any thoughts about how to start engaging them in ways that are age appropriate and, and meaningful? Yeah, I think, you know, it kind of uh, have them have them involved where they want to be involved. Like they, I find kids, it's, it's more of like, you're, you don't have the time to help them rather than like, oh, get our kids engaged. Like, you know, when, once they're teenagers, maybe it's a little bit harder, but I find like every, every little kid that I've ever met is super, super into nature. And so, you know, um, it, it can be as simple as having them, you know, if you have to have like a, like a summer camp for them, cause you're working or whatever, like make it a, a nature summer camp, like get them, get them out there, get them, um, like in the mud, you know, and, and take the time. It's really hard. I know it's really hard when, cause almost everybody's a working parent cause you can't afford not to be right. So you're tired and you get home and you just want to chill on the couch, but maybe you got to get out there and like have a water fight and just like go look for, for tadpoles and stuff like that. You know um, what I think, you know, we're Clayton was talking about how so much of our ecological knowledge is embedded in language. And so like little things are like learning the months in Cree, you know, a March is Niskipi Sim. So it's, it's like goose month right now. Why is it goose month? You know, like talking about like the, 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 the moments, that are really important in the in the space that you're in. What are the what are the changes that happen? What, what's going on with the animals? You know, and then I think too that we have to recognize like once those kids get older, they may start wanting to participate in things that um, that scare you because then you're coming up against police and you're coming up against situations where maybe they're going to be arrested. You know, like let's let's be honest about what 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 some of these young people are facing. Um, and so rather than saying like, no, 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 you can't be involved in that because it's, it's, uh, you know, you could get arrested and that's your future. I think we got to start thinking about how are we supporting young people, you know, in school, for example, at university, like I remember when Standing Rock was going on, we had students going out there, um, you know, and spending a lot of time. And what did that mean? That meant that they lost a semester. Where's the understanding? Where's the support for those students? Where's, where's the support when they get back to make sure that they didn't lose their entire university career because they went out and stood in solidarity and, and put themselves out there. We got to think about our high school kids too. You know, like they're in there in here, here in uh, Edmonton. I know this is a problem in, in, uh, in Winnipeg too. You got these, you got cops in schools, right? Like they're, they're being, they're being policed all the time. So we got to accept that sometimes, you know, they're going to be in a position where, the state says this isn't right and there might be punishment. So how do we how do we collectively make sure that we're supporting those kids? If we're saying it's important to be out there, it's important to take a stand. Sometimes that means that the consequences are pretty severe, you know. So I just I think being aware of that, too, that it's not going to all be experiments and and uh, and walks on the land. You know, the fact is, is that uh, pushing for climate justice means you're you're pushing against a system of violence and. Uh, we want to protect our kids as much as possible. So we have to be realistic about the, the risks out there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of really great organizations um, like for that kind of like more advanced, like, you know, like your, your teenagers are going to protests or whatever um, as far as organizations that are experts on tactics and how to assess, um, you know, do, do risk assessment and how to deal with police, how to deal with media, you know, um, groups like the Rucka Society and the Indigenous People's Power Project, um, the School of Unity and Liberation has excellent, excellent online resources that you can order as educators and parents on, you know, a, a lot of these, these, these very complex issues. And there are, you know, professionals, experts out there who literally that's what they do. They, they go out and train people 
on nonviolent direct action. Um, and, um, you know, and, 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 and so those resources exist and it's, 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 it's really easy to package those things up and to give those to your young people and to support them with some bucks to, you know, bring an expert in that they can consult with if they're planning, you know, direct action in their community. Um, so that they do it, uh, you know, in a safe way where they're not putting themselves in danger or anyone else. Um, you know, th th there, there's a lot of really good resources for, for um, direct action um, and, and the media work that comes with it. That's a really, a really powerful reminder too. Um, I, I see this question about the eight-year-old daughter and white settler guilt that I kind of wanted to address. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, I think I, so the, the question is my eight-year-old daughter struggles with white settler guilt. She's learning about beginning to understand the legacy of colonialism, uh, struggles to place herself as a young kid in this relationship past and present. So I think this is something too, this is something that like at everybody of every age, like non-Indigenous peoples really struggle with. And so, um, I think part of the thing is to understand, you know, we're talking about structures here. You know, I always, I always, I always make like the metaphor of the house, like Canada is a house, it's built, it's built, you know, on, on the dispossession of Indigenous peoples, it's built on genocide, it's built in part as well on transatlantic slave trade, you know, it's like, it's, it's built on a series of, of, of terrible things. So when you come here, whether you come here or you're born here, you're being born or coming into a structure that exists. And it's not about your individual choices. You didn't, you didn't build the house, you know, like we can, we can put people in different rooms. Uh, we can, we can do some renovations, but the structure's still there, right? It's, it's, it's a collective issue. It's a, it's a structural issue. So as individuals, our, 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 what we need to do is learn about the structures and, and understand how it functions and how, uh, how it looks in a variety of different circumstances. And then not sit there and feel like I did this, you know, like, and also not let ourselves off the hook because we didn't do this. You know, I never colonized anyone. Therefore, I don't have to do anything like there's 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 no borders on 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 the land that that are real. There's no borders on the water that's real. There's no borders in the air that's real. We're all living here together. So we all have to understand those structures and not worry about like, did I, did I do this? Do, should I feel guilty? But rather once you know, once you understand how the systems work, then you either make the choice to do something about it or you make the choice not to, but th both of those things are choices and little kids, you know, you are not, are not going to like burn the house down. The, the, the thing that we can do with our young children is just make them understand how the structures work and reassure them and ourselves that we're not bad people because those structures exist and also not um, disempower ourselves by thinking that, that there's nothing we can do because it's bigger than us. So just, I think, you know, tell your kid that this is, this is the history um, and let them understand it in an age appropriate way, but that making them feel guilty is not the point. Guilt doesn't do anything for any of us. Right. So mm -hmm. You empower your kids by by showing them how change can be made in in you know and it, it can be like you know go go to that community garden take them take them to community events it doesn't have to all be doom and gloom like I said like there's a lot of joy in being in community with other people so I think when you start to relate to others and that and that really human way where you just you're celebrating things together then that's the space where you come up with the 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 energy to to make change in that good way together so. Yeah, I, I just that just makes me sad. You know, I don't want I, I don't want people sitting out there feeling guilty because it it's not useful and it's not really the point. So I hope I hope you have ways to talk about this with your your kids um, and go and, yeah. and and past past guilt. You know, I think that's such a a beautiful response. And I mean, I think with guilt, you know, people can can turn towards it with empathy or away from it in shame. And so teaching children like it's okay to feel sad for what has happened and continues to happen to indigenous people but you're not powerless in that dynamic you're not That's shackled fun. to it yeah, yeah. And, and i think that i think that there's a lot of really uh, you know there's a renaissance that's happening right now in the literary world um amazing oh, yeah. children's books coming out dealing you know from indigenous authors like tasha spillett and uh, Jenny De, Depuy, like there's a bunch of really great kids books um, that dive deep into 
uh, the urban indigenous experience into the residential school experience um, and translate that in a way for, for young ones to digest a little bit easier. And that's what I talked about at the beginning of this call. You know, we really have to be mindful about curating these very nuanced and, 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 and complex, you know, historical uh, truths, um, you know, so that we, we, we don't make our little ones feel powerless. You know, yeah. and so maybe, you know, what I would say is talk about it a few times. And right after you talk about it, do a fun art project or do the dishes, uh, sweep the floor, give them something that they can do that makes them feel powerful, that they can finish from A to Z right after you talk. And that that helps with the psychology of this stuff, eh? Yeah. Um, yeah. I I feel really fortunate that there are so many books that I can buy for my daughter that, you know, didn't exist when I was a kid. I also will recommend the works of um, the illustrated works of Julie Flett. She collaborates with a lot of Indigenous storytellers, but she's a beautiful illustrator and her books for um, like toddlers and young children are really accessible entry points into these subjects in ways that I think are really lovely. Um, the other thing so, I would say too is um, like abstract stuff. Uh, like I think that all non-native folks would really benefit from like the writings of Daniel Ojik, uh, or, or she did. She she illustrated all the Nanabush teachings. There's a series of thirteen books you can get, um, and and those books, man, they really have deep, deep, nuanced teachings in them that come from like right at the beginning of creation. Um, so yeah, like, you know, there's lots of cool stuff like that, that I, you know, get that stuff for your little ones. Cause it's beautiful, beautiful storytelling. Um, you know. Yeah. And it's a treat for parents too. I can tell you firsthand. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there are questions in the chat we didn't get to, and I, I apologize for that, but I'm grateful for everyone who shared these really insightful questions and to Clayton and Chelsea for answering them so thoughtfully, I think. This was a really wonderful discussion. I'm coming out of it feeling restored and hopeful, which is hopefully how other folks are leaving as well. Um, and I'll just pass back to Natalie, who I think has a few housekeeping things to wrap up our chat. But I just want to express again my gratitude to, to Chelsea and Clayton, to the both of you for, for sharing with us today. So, yeah. All right, that's singular. Can I ask him it now? Well, that's plural. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. I have to take Chelsea's Cree course. You and me both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so, so much to all three of you. Miigwech, thank you, merci. Um, I'm very hesitant to try to be eloquent and sum up <laughs> what I'm taking in this moment. I think we're all gonna um, need some time to think and integrate and reflect on all the amazing wisdom and bombs you've shared with us today. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time and sharing it so generously with us. And to all of you participants for being here or watching this video into the future for taking the time to sit with Michelle, Chelsea and Clayton today and really listen. I think there's a couple things I would pull out as a thread. Clayton saying we, we don't have time anymore. There's no out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. We can really take that to heart, I hope, within the Four Kids Network and our allies here. And uh, Chelsea reminding us to listen, believe, support. Um, yeah, so just in closing, I wish we had another whole hour or two or day, <laughs> um, but we will share in the chat now and in an email and follow up with everyone who registered all the links that were shared today, we'll see if we can get the answers to some of the questions that were asked um, reflected on an answer if possible, if we can borrow any more time <laughs> from our generous panelists. Um, we encourage you to donate to the organizations we're gonna suggest. Um, we also have a feedback form that the four kids team would really, really, really love everyone who's participated or watched this video to fill out, to give us some, um, yeah, some feedback about where we go next, what uh, a future event training or action could be from all the learnings we gathered today. Great reminder, there's a global climate strike tomorrow led by young people. So if you can go to um, fridaysforfuture.org and find out if there's an event near you that you can go and support. 
And if you're inspired, if you're a parent or grandparent or have a kid in your life that you love and you're interested in the Four Kids Network, please join us at fourkids.ca slash join. We would love to have you um, get involved. And before you log off, I know it's right at the, the moment, but if you could share in the chat before you go, just how you're feeling leaving today in one word or a reasonable sentence <laughs> um, that's not too long. I know there's probably so much, but use the feedback form to give us more feedback. There's lots of um, opportunity there to offer more uh, in-depth feedback and reflections. But yeah, we'd love uh, some quick feedback with a word or sentence of how you're leaving today. So thank you again so, so much for all you've shared and for everyone for being here. I'm leaving very inspired and grateful.